In the spring of 2014, exactly nine years, exactly nine years and two days ago, I was standing alone in my garage in Arinda, about to cut and place the first piece of golden stained glass on what we all now know as California horn. That massive mosaic that hangs above the bar just outside this studio. It is a 16 foot long, four foot tall beast, an iconic bear with wings and a unicorn horn lumbering across a vast void, rays of darkness shooting out from its head, forever taking its next step into the blackness. I remember the feel of the glass cutter in my hand, the squeak of the oiled metal roller scoring the golden water glass, the press of the goggles on the bridge of my nose, the snap as I squeezed the glass nipper, and one piece became two. I held the newly cut piece of glass between my fingertips and placed it on the ridge of the wing of the California corn, and then another, and another, thoughtfully, steadily, moving forward. Here we go, I thought. How the hell did I end up here? Now, rewind several years, I was newly married, and my new husband, AKA the self-proclaimed National Endowment for Molly's Arts, <laughs> AKA Dan, and I were living the high life in the hate. If you didn't find me walking our dog in the panhandle, you'd probably find me closing the Cafe Royale after theater pub, at Folsom and 17th, rehearsing a Killing My Lobster show, or at the exit. I had just done my first equity show, so I felt fancy. Uh, I was an annually making mosaics for the SF Olympians Festival. My voiceover work had begun as a hobby, but had recently become my livelihood. Life was late nights with Giants games, raucous songs in our living room, endless voiceover auditions, theater production after theater production, and our dog getting high from eating someone's stash in Golden Gate Park. <laughs> it, that happened. It was during, she was okay. It was during this time that I first heard of Piano Fight, and within a few months, Piano Fight seemed to be everywhere. I would walk past their short-lived new play festival each night after rehearsal at the off-market theater, not knowing who these people were. And then suddenly, I was just singing in the basement of Cafe Royale with Duncan Wold after a theater pub performance, or watching Rob Reddy's llama spit about drinking alone. <laughs> and I got to wondering, who are these people? And why are they all so talented and funny? And why haven't I met them before? And how can I know them now? <laughs> and would they think I'm funny and nice and talented? And then it was a late night, like so many others. And, but on this one, I was at a bar in Soma, maybe the Tempest, I don't remember. Uh, after some sh theater show I was in, or I went to, sipping on something intoxicating next to Rob Reddy. And I had just told him about this mosaic I had made for my friend's bar, the beer hall, and I showed him a picture. Now, <clears throat> something I've noticed, and maybe you have too, and if you don't know him, I will let you know that Rob Reddy has something like this weird super ability, or superpower maybe, maybe where he can assess a person and their talents, be it musician, actor, artist, or otherwise, in like a microsecond, somehow convince this person that they have the capability to achieve levels of possibility heretofore unthought of, so Rob Reddy, with his magical Californicorn vision, silver tongues that possibility of ability into the person's brain. And even as they laugh hysterically and say, absolutely not, there's no way I could ever do that. He'll say, just think about it. And then he'll sip his beer. And you will think about it, maybe obsessively until one day it becomes real. And you say, hey, <laughs> Rob, um, remember that thing you said I could do, but I didn't think I could actually do it? Um, I'm ready. And Rob will chuckle in his all-knowing, but not really all-knowing. <laughs> Rob way. And as if this was his plan all along, 
long, and well, that thing for me was the Californicorn. I mean, I wasn't really a mosaic artist. I had taken a class on making a birdbath mosaic using teacups, <laughs> and, but that was like about it. And when I learned the dimensions <laughs> for this piano fight mosaic, 16 feet long by four feet tall, are you kidding me? I mean, I backed away so fast from that project. There was no way I could make anything on that scale for a venue like that. I mean, <laughs> besides, where would I find the time? I was an actor, not a mosaic artist. We must label ourselves, right? <laughs> I mean, we, we must define our purpose and our path in life. Be this, not that. Could I do it? Wait, could I make something like that? That large, that, that visible? Did I have the work ethic, the dedication, the ability? So I checked in with the National Endowment for Molly's Arts and <laughs> he suggested to at least think about it. I could always say no, but why not consider it? Though inside he probably was like, what the fuck? Why would you make such a thing such you, as you have never made before? But he knows me, and he was also probably like, fuck, you're gonna do it. <laughs> and you're probably gonna do it fucking well. <laughs> so I said yes. And I found a class in architectural applications for mosaics, and research commenced. I met with the heads of Piano Fight, Rob Reddy and Dan Williams, and the essential Kevin Fink, and they gave me the original design by the talented Ariel Hansen Strong. I met the architect and designer, and after emails and discussions about materials, we decided with some convincing that stained glass was the way to go instead of one inch by one inch tile. I mean, they didn't want a mosaic by number, they wanted a mosaic by Molly. <laughs> We decided on four colors, gold, copper, white, and black, agreed on final dimensions. It was happening, and I fully surrendered to the possibility that I could make this beast. One month later, my Dan and I discovered we were pregnant. I mean, it wasn't a complete surprise. We had been trying for a while. I was 34, and we'd been together for almost 10 years. So, you know, we gave it a good go. <laughs> it had been almost a year since we had been consciously trying, and so far, it hadn't happened yet. And then late one night in the Alembic, in the hate, we had a difficult conversation about whether it was actually going to happen. And we surrendered to the possibility that it may just be us. And we were okay with that. But now, with the prospect of a baby on the horizon, everything changed. Priorities shifted instantaneously. I dropped out of a show I had recently been cast in. I took a nap, and then one day, my Dan had found a house for rent in Orinda. And by the new year, we were living on the other side of the bay. Our lives turned upside down, excited and a little bit scared or maybe freaked out of our minds because suddenly I didn't know what I was going to get to do anymore. Uh, would I still be able to be an actor, an artist? I mean, people do it all the time, right? But could I? I had no clue. I, I knew the one thing I did know was that this little blueberry was growing inside of me and hopefully would keep growing. My focus had changed. So I surrendered again to this new idea of being mom. I surrendered to the idea of not having time in the near future to act. I surrendered to not making the mosaic. I hadn't heard much from the Piano Fight crew anyway for a while after our initial flurry of activity all those months ago. I'd been so busy with our new developments I hadn't reached out. Perhaps they had forgotten or moved on. And so I thought maybe I could too. I'm not quite sure how the next part happened. I know it happened in late January 2014. I remember I was sitting on the floor of my living room on the phone with Dan Williams. I remember telling him I was pregnant and that I'm pretty sure I had taken myself out of the running to make this thing. 
but he would not let me. I, mean, I remember him pumping me up like I was about to get back into a boxing ring. <laughs> like this locker room pep talk extraordinaire, and then suddenly it was back on. And it just it, it had to be done by April, and my little boy was due at the end of May. <laughs> and so there I was, alone in my garage, six and a half months pregnant, about to commence on this monstrosity. Sheets of gold, copper, black and white stained glass had been purchased and ready to be in individually scored and cut along with four pieces of four foot by four foot cement board. It was so big I had to make it in sections. Thin set, check, grout, check, confidence. Um, <laughs> check. At the beginning, for beginnings are almost always filled with uncertainty, I constantly questioned everything. Did I have enough glass? How do you choose a crib? Or a car seat? What the fuck was I doing? Who the hell did I think I was taking all of this on? There is no time. But. I just kept showing up and cutting and gluing. First, that gl golden ridge along the wing, then the gold highlights of the bear, followed by the wing itself organically taking shape as I allowed my intuition to take hold and lead me. The low copper tones of the bear came next, and so on. My blueberry was now an orange or maybe a pineapple or something. They have such interesting fruit descriptions <laughs> for the size of your baby. And so my orange pineapple baby was growing alongside our dear Unibear as I worked on her, carving out time and glass pieces each day. We never can plan or research enough, but we sure can try. Uh, you can read all the So You Think You're Gonna Be a Parent books in the world and take all the mosaic classes and still we won't really know what we are doing until we are doing it. Doing the work. And in the doing, finding meaning, finding connection between pieces of glass, between people. The preparation never truly prepares you until you are in it up to your elbows. At 30 weeks or seven months pregnant, my midwife felt that the baby hadn't turned and was in a breech position, which means he was gonna be born butt first. I had been born breech naturally 35 years before, so I felt pretty confident that it was a possibility, but I had been wanting a home birth and it's not legal to have a home birth to a breech baby in California. So, more surrendering occurred. I surrendered to the possibility that I wouldn't have a home birth we planned for, Surrender to the possibility of a C-section. Surrender had become my word. And also my mantra as I embarked on this path towards motherhood. And also on my artistic path of life. Surrendering it all to the unknown. Seeing the difficulty and the challenges of, the, of this art piece and of giving birth. And figuring out how the hell I was gonna be a mom to this new human and embracing all the fear and uncertainty and finding power in that surrender. I mean, the one thing we can count on in life is that no matter how much we strive for control, how much we research and plan, it, it is all going to change. It will rarely work out the way we initially thought. Plans evolve, paths shift, friends change. People we never knew become our dearest, dearest friends. We become parents, or we don't, or we can't. We become artists, or we don't, or we can't. We figure out how to keep our new humans alive. We cry and we wail when we don't know how to soothe them. We question our abilities. We fear the uncertainty and the unknown. Working in that garage, my human baby and my art baby growing side by side, I found that I rarely felt alone. Knowing this creation would watch over so many artists once she was hung. 
The California corn began to feel like a salvation to connect me to my artistic world and past, and each piece laid led me toward the future. I wondered sometimes as I began on the rays of black water glass shooting out of her head what people would see when they sat beneath her great wings. Would they ever know she had a little human twin growing alongside her? Instead of wings, he grew eyelashes and toenails. Instead of a horn, his bones were being formed. A new heartbeat inside of me as I was making a piece of art that would become the heartbeat of a new creative venue. My son, and years later my daughter, would become my home. And the California corn would become the symbol of an artistic home for so many artists in the Bay Area and beyond. Four days after placing the last piece of black glass on the California corn, my son, Gunnar Dean Peterson, having turned his head down in my belly, <laughs> was born mere steps away from that mythical creature that was lying quietly in my dark garage, birds chirping in the dawn. And for years to come, after she was hung in her not really forever home, late at night or early in the morning, cradling my sweet new human, the twin to the guardian of 144 Taylor, coaxing him back to sleep, the California corn would be there in the silence and the dark of piano fight, watching over this space, this venue, at least until now. As we approach the closing of this chapter in the book of Piano Fight, the question has been raised, can we take it down? Nine years ago, my three-month-old son watched peacefully from his blanket on the floor as we hung and grouted the mosaic. With incredible optimism, we screwed her up there and glued glass over the top of the screws and grouted it all with the attitude of, fuck it! She's going to be up here forever, or at least longer than nine years. But we can't plan for a pandemic. I guess we can't plan for any of it. What we can continue to do is show up and work together to continue to make art and inspire others to do the same no matter where we find ourselves. Piano Fight allows us all to experiment with art take risks, say yes, and what next? A couple of weeks ago, I found myself and my two kids playing in Dan Williams' backyard, among many other piano fighters who now had children as well. Caden, Dan Williams' son, said, hey, Gunner, to my son, and with a spark of delight in his eye, took off running. Catch me, he said, and a game of tag commenced the yes and game continuing on to the next generation. And then the other night, I was at Piano Fight for the first time in three years. I had volunteered to work the box office and got the chance to reminisce with Kevin Fink and Rob Reddy, two of the three masterminds who coaxed me into making our beautiful beast. I sat quietly before the venue opened and gazed up at the California corn and remembered how hard I worked to cut and glue each piece. Every section seemed so important and individual. The mistakes made felt so gigantic. I mean, how many times had I cut and recut the feathers for the wings? I thought of the blood that had dripped from the cuts and scars on my hands and from others' hands who had helped me here and there. That blood seeped into and under the layers of glass and glue and grout. Now, stepping back, its wholeness enveloped me. I thought of how every person who has been a part of Piano Fight, the making of the space, or entered this venue and gazed up at California Corn's flowing wings and spiral horn, had they wondered where she came from? Each artist to perform or direct or sing or make people laugh or cry here, everyone is a piece of the California Corn. They're a piece of the Piano Fight mosaic. Up close, each person adding their individual moments to the whole that is piano fight. And their lives are mosaics, every moment unique, a small bit of the whole person in a whole imperfect, uncertain life. I think of what's to come, 
how we must all surrender to the inevitable end of this precious space. How we must partially destroy the California corn in order for her to be saved. We have to rip her apart to salvage her in the end. Where will she end up? The MoMA? <laughs> Another future theater? Or perhaps for a while in my garage again, dismantled and in pieces, alone in the dark, but always watching for her next move, ever lumbering onward to some unknown future. Oh, Molly Benson. 